All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about what's a title I've entitled End of the Age, Jacob versus Esau. We're going to be giving you really a road map or a context for what the entire Bible is written from. And in these last days with the wars that are happening between Israel and the Palestinians and Gaza and Hamas and the terrorists and everything that's going to happen in the future, it is critical that you understand this very basic teaching that I'm going to give you to show you that we cannot interpret prophecy from a 21st century Western Greco-Roman perspective. We have to take it all the way back to its original root, to its original context, and its original backdrop if we're going to really understand it. Otherwise, we're going to end up with new ideas of what prophecies about, who the Antichrist is, and most of us that are prophecy people uh, in the world, uh, in ministries, are coming from a Greco-Roman 21st century Roman perspective. And in order to, tr- matter of fact, 95% of all prophecy ministries on the planet come from the United States of America, and 95% of them do not even know about the feast days of the Lord, which are all about the first and second coming of the Messiah. So how can we trust prophecy students today or prophecy ministries today if they don't even take in consideration the feast of God, which all of them have to do with the first and second coming of the Messiah? So tonight is not going to be a night where I'm going to go over the feast of the Lord. I already have a series called God's Prophetic Calendar where I go over all of those feast days, probably 12 hours worth uh, to be exact. But tonight we're going to focus on Jacob and Esau and how they relate to the conflict that's going on today in Israel. Let's begin. First of all, it is nothing other than a family feud. How many have heard of the Hatfields and McCoys? How many know that today we have the Hatfields and McCoys? We have Jacob and Esau on the left. You see the flag of Israel on the right. You see the Islamic flag. And we're going to talk about the, why those two flags are so critical. They both contain stars. Only one is legitimate. Let's keep going. This is what we're looking at, is two fighters in a round, in a, in a ring, going round after round after round. Now, not to stretch things out, but how many rounds are there in boxing? There are 12 rounds. Anybody ever wonder why? I don't know why. Maybe God's trying to tell us something. There's one for each tribe of Israel. At the end of the day, we need to ask, what is all the fighting really about? Why do the Palestinian people, uh, by and large, hate the Jewish people? Why is there so much hatred towards this little bitty country the size of New Jersey that keeps giving away land for peace, keeps uh, submitting to the world system and and the delegations and the dignitaries and the United States and the United Nations, and they keep ending up on the short end of the stick and the missiles keep getting closer? We need to find out what the fighting is all about because all of the fighting is end times related. It ends up in the great battle of Armageddon. It really is all about Jacob and Esau. Genesis chapter 25 verse 20 says this, And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, you know who, he's, who is being referred to there is Jacob and Esau, who is inside the womb of their mother, and they're wrestling. And the first one that comes out is Esau. The second one that comes out is Jacob. So technically, Esau is the firstborn, but Jacob is that's why it says the older will serve the younger. So that's Jacob and Esau. But before we get to Jacob and Esau, let's back up and talk about Isaac and Ishmael. Because now we're all the way back to Abraham. Genesis chapter 16 verse 11 says this, The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. 
He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. And so right here we get some characteristics. We get some personality uh, uh, descriptions of Ishmael and Isaac and how the relationship is going to go. It makes it very clear that Ishmael is going to be a wild donkey. In the Hebrew there, that is a wild ass. That is not a phrase. Uh, it, is not, it is derogatory, but it is a real animal that exists in the Middle East. And so he is giving a description of Ishmael based on the description of this wild donkey, of a wild ass. And so we're going to actually show you the description of that in just a minute. So here we go. Here is the description of a wild ass in the New, in the, the New Testament, or excuse me, in the, uh, in the uh, Tanakh times, the Old Testament times, during the time of Jacob. Most active during the night. So the, the wild donkey in Israel is most active during the night. Their territory marker is dung heaps. They tolerate intruders into their territory, but consider them as subordinates. Unlike other hoofed animals, they don't flee from danger. They investigate it first and then decide what to do. Now, if you know where I'm going with this, you're going to see that Ishmael today is still fighting Jacob, and this is the exact attributes that Ishmael has today. They're most active during the night. Turn on the news. Their territory marker is dung heaps. They tolerate intruders into their territory, but consider them as subordinates because they, cons they believe that they are the ones that hold the birthright. So everyone is subordinate to them. Jews, Christians alike, we're all in the same boat. We are infidels. And other like other hoofed animals, they're not as scared. They're not scared of anyone. They will investigate first and then in wisdom decide what to do. This will make more sense as we go along. Genesis chapter 17 verse 20 says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. Now, what's really, really interesting is if we had time to go through the actual blessing of Isaac and Jacob, it says Jacob gave a blessing to his grandson Ephraim. Remember this? The crossing of the hands from Manasseh to Ephraim. And it says what? It says that Ephraim is going to be great fullness of what? The nations. There's a plural. That it says that, he is, you're, that Israel is going to be great nations. That there is going to be a fullness into the nations. But with Ishmael, there's going to be a great nation. And that is hugely prophetic and very significant in these end days. Here's, here's why. is because right now there exist multiple, multiple nations in both the Jacob category and the Ishmael category of all the Arab states. But what is the desire of the terrorist organizations? What is the desire of Ishmael, to have one state called the Islamic State. And that's when this prophecy is going to come right before your eyes, and it's happening on the news right now. Both Isaac and Ishmael were prophesied to be great nations. And who is Ishmael today? Ishmael is the father of the Arab people of the Arabian Peninsula. We can tra track and trace his genealogy. They are the Arab people. So here is uh, where you see the Middle East, Upper Africa, the Mediterranean coastline. We're going to zoom in on uh, Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. In case you're not familiar with the peninsula, this is it. Now we're into Saudi Arabia, okay? So the Arabian people 
are, they, are the people of Ishmael. So let me give you some statistics to give you an idea of how big this prophecy is. There are over 360 million Arabs. There's not even that many United States uh, Americans. This is 25% of the 1.5 billion Muslims worldwide as of 2009. So there's more than that now. So of all the Muslims in the world, the Arab people make up 25%. So not Arab, not all Arabs or are Muslims, okay? Many are Christians and so on and so forth. But 25% are Arabs. Islam is the dominant religion of the Arabs and is the second largest religion worldwide next to Christianity. There are 2.2 billion Christians that claim to be Christians worldwide. There are over today 1.7 billion Muslims. It's the second largest religion. In 2000, there were approximately 1 million living in the United States. Today, there are 7 million by most estimates. Some say 7 to 10 million. These are the Arab states that you can see, okay? So you had the Arabian Peninsula and then all the migration into the upper part of the continent of Africa, and these are all of the Arab states today. Look at all the ones that carry the Islamic symbol right there on their flag. Next week, I'm going to be going into extreme detail on where that crescent moon and that star came from, what does it mean, and what does it mean today in prophecy. You're going to see it. And you see, let me just give you just a 30-second backdrop of the religion of Islam, and I know that this is not going to be popular politically, but I can tell you that us Americans kind of get the idea that all religions are the same. They just have like a, a few different ideologies, you know, but really ultimately they all have some truth built into it, and they're all pretty nice. Uh, they all just kind of want to get a No, Islam is different. That religion is built from a position of superiority going back to they believe that it was not Jacob that was supposed to get the blessing. It was Esau, not Isaac. It was supposed to be Ishmael. And so from that perspective, everyone is supposed to die in that order. They are the only ones that are supposed to be alive so that the, the, their prophet and the, and the Mahdi and their Messiah can come back. It can't come back, according to their, their theology, unless we are all dead. Our theology doesn't say that. Thus, all religions are not the same. So it's not just another religion. It is a religion that is against mankind. It is a religion that ends in death. This is why they do what they do. Is because... It is in their blood. Why are they trying to kill the Jewish people and the Christian people? And why are they beheading Christians as we speak? By the way, they're the only terrorist organization in the world that is beheading people. And there is a prophecy about in the end days that my people will be beheaded in my name. Did you know the only people that do that are the Islamic jihadists? There's no other organization that does that except for the Islamic jihadist on large scales. I'm not saying that there isn't somebody that gets beheaded every once in a while, but this is their model. There's a reason why they're doing this. They're not doing it just to, to, uh, uh, you know, to have time on the nightly news. This is embedded into their DNA to show this is our theology. This is what we believe. <clears throat> and these are the organizations that are wanting to run it. Now, what I'm going to show you here right now is a seven-minute video that gives you the idea and some context that will utterly shock your system. Some of you have seen this before when I played this. But this is a seven-minute video that gives you Islamic demographics to show you where we're at today with the spread of Islam in the earth realm. Today in Europe, you almost see it on the news every single night. 
that Islam and Muslims are taking over parts of Europe. Protest uh, every day now in Europe. Huge, thousands and thousands of, of Muslims. And there's a reason for that. You did not see this 20 years ago at all in Europe. Europe was white Caucasian, hands down. Today, it is not at all. The demographics are changing, and it's because of this video. According to research, in order for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there must be a fertility rate of 2.11 children per family. With anything less, the culture will decline. Historically, no culture has ever reversed a 1.9 fertility rate. A rate of 1.3, impossible to reverse, because it would take 80 to 100 years to correct itself and there is no economic model that can sustain a culture during that time. In other words, if two sets of parents each have one child, there are half as many children as parents. If those children have one child, then there are one-fourth as many grandchildren as grandparents. If only a million babies are born in 2006, it's hard to have two million adults enter the workforce in 2026. As the population shrinks, so does the culture. As of 2007, the fertility rate in France was 1.8, England 1.6, Greece 1.3, Germany 1.3, Italy 1.2, Spain 1.1. Across the entire European Union of 31 countries, the fertility is a mere 1.38. Historical research tells us these numbers are impossible to reverse. In a matter of years, Europe as we know it will cease to exist. Yet the population of Europe is not declining. Why? Immigration. Islamic immigration. Of all population growth in Europe since 1990, 90% has been Islamic immigration. France, 1.8 children per family. Muslims, 8.1. In southern France, traditionally one of the most populated church regions in the world, there are now more mosques than churches. 30% of children ages 20 and younger are Islamic. In the larger cities, such as Nice, Marseille, and Paris, that number has grown to 45%. By 2027, one in five Frenchmen will be Muslim. In just 39 years, France will be an Islamic Republic. In the last 30 years, the Muslim population of Great Britain rose from 82,000 to 2.5 million a 30-fold increase. There are over 1,000 mosques, many of them former churches. In the Netherlands, 50% of all newborns are Muslim. And in only 15 years, half of the population of the Netherlands will be Muslim. In Russia, there are over 23 million Muslims. That's one out of five Russians. 40% of the entire Russian army will be Islamic in just a few short years. Currently in Belgium, 25% of the population and 50% of all newborns are Muslim. The government of Belgium has stated one third of all European children will be born to Muslim families by 2025, just 17 years away. The German government, the first to talk about this publicly, 
recently released a statement saying, the fall in the German population can no longer be stopped. Its downward spiral is no longer reversible. It will be a Muslim state by the year 2050. Muammar al-Qaddafi of Libya said, there are signs that Allah will grant victory to Islam in Europe without swords, without guns, without conquest. We don't need terrorists. We don't need homicide bombers. The 50 plus million Muslims in Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. There are currently 52 million Muslims in Europe. The German government said that number is expected to double in the next 20 years to 104 million. Closer to home, the numbers tell a similar story. Right now, Canada's fertility rate is 1.6, nearly a full point below what is required to sustain a culture. And Islam is now the fastest growing religion. Between 2001 and 2006, Canada's population increased by 1.6 million, 1.2 of those immigration. In the United States, the current fertility rate of American citizens is 1.6. With the influx of the Latino nations, the rate increases to 2.11, the bare minimum required to sustain a culture. In 1970, there were 100,000 Muslims in America. Today, there are over 9 million. The world is changing. It's time to wake up. Three years ago, a meeting of 24 Islamic organizations was held in Chicago. The transcripts of that meeting showed in detail their plans to evangelize America through journalism, politics, education, and more. They said, we must prepare ourselves for the reality that in 30 years, there will be 50 million Muslims living in America. The world that we live in is not the world in which our children and grandchildren will live. The Catholic Church recently reported that Islam has just surpassed their membership numbers. Some studies show that at Islam's current rate of growth, in five to seven years, it will be the dominant religion of the world. As believers, we call upon you to join the effort to share the gospel message with the changing world. This is a call to action. If that doesn't wake you up, nothing will. And although that video is several years old now, I think it's 2008 uh, when that, that video was made, the numbers continue to rise. And if the birth rates remain the same, then the statistics are just statistics. Birth rates can change, and I pray that they do, but if they stay at 8.1, they will literally take over majority in so many countries across the world. Today we are seeing more and more uh, mosque, more and more of, of their religion growing, and with that ideology, and with that politics. It's only a matter of time. And I wanted to show you that, that it, uh, how relevant that uh, particular video is, not only to this teaching, but to your life, to the, your children, your grandchildren are going to see the reality of this, that someday, I know it's hard to believe, that if everything remains the same, America will no longer be a Christian nation. We will be the minorities. And how many of you know, even right now, that we are starting to become the minorities? In some sectors, you can't even get hired unless you're a minority. Mentioning about the Muslim Brotherhood, the good news about, uh, if there's any good news whatsoever in the geopolitical realm, is that the Muslim Brotherhood, at least in Egypt, has been ousted. Bottom line, Ishmael will become a great nation and will strike back at his brother. You see, there's one thing that American Christians have against us. We don't understand the issue of patience. We can't wait. We don't understand time. Where the rest of the world, uh, like Islam and even the country of China, their goals start at 50 years. Like our goals are like we have a one-week goal, a two-week goal, a three-month goal. The Chinese has a 50-year plan because they understand how to take over world. 
is different than in the days of Alexander the Great where you just beat each other up. You can take over a world by owning all of the property. And that's what's happening. Many of you don't know that. We don't have time to go into that. But most of the assets inside of America are owned by other countries. Do you realize that if someone owns the majority of the assets that you have in your house, that at some point they have the right to come kick you out? And that is about what is to happen in the United States of America. And in prophecy, it's all setting up the dominoes to start coming right down the pipe. Let's keep going. Let's talk about Isaac for a second. We know that Isaac became, became the children of the promise, Israel, which is made up of both the house of Judah, the Jewish people, and the house of Israel, mainly Christians that are grafted into the olive tree. We know that from Jeremiah 31, the new covenant is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Today, the Jewish people are very obvious. They came back from Babylon. There's your southern kingdom of Judah. But everybody else that's part of Israel, we have no idea who they are, where they came from. All our Bibles tells us in the New Testament is that you're graft, we are grafted in to Israel. And so this is why when we have prayer for Israel, when Israel goes to war and we, and we, and we keep modern day Israel, the Jewish people, in our prayers, why are they so connected to the Christian people? Because most Christians don't know that we're grafted into the same root. We're grafted into the same tree. We are brothers. And so from that perspective, there is a connection. Does that make sense? Okay. And I have a teaching called Identity Crisis uh, that goes into that in great detail. Isaac versus Ishmael. There are 1.5 billion Muslims worldwide. 2.2 billion Christians and Jews. Two great nations. So here's the family tree, just so you know. You got Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. From the line of Sarah, remember God tells Sarah, I'm going to give you a child. Remember, she laughs because she's old in age. So he says, go into, she says, go into my maidservant Hagar. So from that perspective or from that lineage, here's what happened. From Sarah comes Isaac. I just want you to see this. Isaac takes Rebekah as a wife. Then Hagar, on the right-hand side, has Ishmael, okay? And then Ishmael has 12 sons. Then from Isaac come Jacob and Esau. So this is the lineage that's moving down. When you put all that together, the lineage of Abraham going through Sarah to Isaac, to Jacob, brings life. The lineage from Hagar to Ishmael to his 12 sons brings death. And that's what we're seeing. This is simply a, a matter of death and life. Life and death. We are seeing this played out in the physical realm with Israel and Hamas and the terrorist groups in the Middle East. But you are also seeing it in the spiritual realm when you're dealing with God trying to get a hold of his people to get them back into covenant, to bring life back into their congregations, back into their marriages, back into their children, so on and so forth. It's the same pattern. So who is Esau today? Because it's different than Ishmael. Numbers 20 verse 14 says, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, this is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that have come upon us. Please let us pass through your country. We just went through that Torah portion just a few weeks ago where Israel wanted to pass through the land of Edom and Esau, which is the Edomites, the brother said, nada, not going to happen. Okay, And there was a whole issue that went along with that that we already went through. But what I want to point out is the fact that the Bible says that Esau, the children of Esau, are the Edomites. So what we need to discover is, where are the Edomites today? Who are those people? Jeremiah 49, verse 7 says, Concerning Edom, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Is there no longer wisdom in Taman? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Turn and flee. Hide in deep caves, you who live in Dedan, for I will bring disaster on Esau at the time I punish him. So again, we have a scripture paralleling and showing us that Esau is Edom. Jeremiah 49, 15 says, Now I will make you small among the nations, despised among men. Now there is a difference between Ishmael and Esau. Because Ishmael was prophesied to be what? A great nation. Esau is prophesied to be a small nation, despised among men. At the sound of their fall, the earth will tremble. Their cry will resound 
at the Red Sea. So Esau equals Edom. Genesis 25, 30, and Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Over and over again in the scriptures, Esau, Edom, Edom equals Esau. Here it is right on the map. You see that Edom, just to give you an idea here, that, uh, that, that uh, this is the Gulf of Aqaba, okay, or the Red Sea, and uh, Jerusalem is in this area, okay? So right here, this is Kadesh Barnea, and Edom represents that area right there, okay? Esau today, so there we go, there's the same area, and e Esau today, or excuse me, is in that area, the kingdom of Edom. If we zoom in a little bit, this is what you get to see. So all of the yellow is modern-day Israel along with the, uh, uh, the uh, 1967 borders there in gray is where Jerusalem is or the West Bank. And Edom is in the two places of the circle and right there on the edge in this area right here along what's called the Gaza Strip. That's where the Edomites settled. What happened was, is that the Edomites, in 1948, remember Jer Jerusalem uh, was given to the Israelis, as an is the Jewish people as an Israel state, but they, what happened was, is all of the Edomites rushed up from the south and took over the Jerusalem area. This is why they were a nation without a capital which was the whole point of the 1967 war. The Six-Day War was to regain the capital of Jerusalem back to the Jewish people. So what happened was the Edomites, or Esau, came up, obtained Jerusalem, took it over, and what happened was is when the war was over, you had a bunch of displaced Edomites without a country. So they are homeless. This is the Palestinian people. This is where the Palestinian people came from. The Palestinian people are the people of Esau. They are the people of Edom that came up into Jerusalem. And when the 1967 war happened and the Jewish people took over their capital, all of these people were still there and literally are now a people without a country, and that is why they are trying to have a two-state solution. This is why the Palestinian people want their own state. Is this making sense? Okay. And so I don't know about you, but the only way that you got your own state or your own country back in the old days is you had to win the war. But now they lose the war, and they still want their own state. By any stretch of anyone's imagination, there is no sense being made in this. Just because they are a displaced people, refugees, if you will, inside of Israel, the governments of the world believe that the Jewish people should give the people that they defeated their own state, their own part of Israel. Divide the land of Israel and give it to the people that you bled over and beat in victory. That would be like us going back, going into Russia, destroying, or better, it would be, be, be uh, Germany during Hitler, and destroying Hitler, and then saying, oh, well, you can still remain in power. We're going to divide the United States into half, and you can have half, and we'll have half. What? It makes no sense, because he wanted to, to, to win the whole world. He wanted to take over all of Europe. So should we give half of Europe to Hitler because we beat him? No. You, if you lose, according to most Nike t-shirts, you go home. But unfortunately, the Edomites don't have a home. And so what happened was, is that over time, they ended up settling back into the Gaza Strip, if you can put that back on my map here. They ended up st settling into the Gaza Strip, and then they also occupy the area in Jerusalem. So the people over here in Gaza Strip, this is where they, Israel gave them. Okay, remember this? It was, it was called land for peace. How many remember that? No, they got the land part right, but the peace part had never came along. So the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians got the land, and then all that did was put them closer to get their rockets into Jerusalem, 
into Israel. And this is what they want to do. Now they want to give them the West Bank. Are you kidding me? Look how close the West Bank is. The West Bank is right there on the heels of Jerusalem. There would be rockets in Jerusalem every day. But they'll say, if you give us the West Bank, we'll be good. That's all we want. No, what they've already said beforehand is that we want to push you into the sea. And the more that you can push us and give us opportunity to do that, we're going to do that. All right, so let's continue. Final proof. Palestine, get this, comes from a root word in Arabic that is literally pronounced. In Arabic, Palestine is pronounced Philistine. It's where we get the the word Philistine from. The original Philistines, guys, this is David versus Goliath. That's all prophecy is. It's David versus Goliath. It's not America. There is no America, okay, in the Bible. In Bible days, in Bible languages, this is David versus Goliath. Verse 10 of Obadiah says, For violence against your brother Jacob. Violence in Hebrew is Hamas. That's what, that's what the Hebrew word Hamas means, is violence. These are the very people that are the governing entity in the Gaza Strip is Hamas. These are the violent people. Listen, this isn't just a, a political government and then there's like a, you know, a terrorist organization that operates underground in the government of Gaza. No, the government of Gaza is the terrorist organization of Hamas. Do you understand? There's a lot that's happening behind the scenes, ladies and gentlemen, and it is prophecy in the making. There are governmental things that are happening in secret that we don't get to see on the news. There are things that we see on the news that we don't interpret properly because we don't have the proper cultural backdrop. So a quick review. Isaac, Jacob are the Judeo-Christian nations. Ishmael became the modern-day Arab nations throughout the Middle East. Esau became the people of Edom or the Philistines. They're still alive today. Islam is the dominant religion of both Ishmael and Esau. Muslims are those that follow Islam. Just giving you some definitions here so that when you watch the nightly news, you'll know what they're saying. Muslims are those that follow Islam. The Edomites, or the Palestinians, took over Jerusalem in 1948 and then were displaced when they lost Jerusalem in 1967. So what did Jacob take from Esau? This is how he did it. He took it in a card game, if you will, where Jacob kind of cheated a little bit and used five aces instead of four. He ended up taking that birthright. That birthright was so important. Not too long from now, we're going to have a conference here, and it's all going to be about the blessing, the family blessing. And you might say, well, in America, you know, we don't do that. The family blessing is so important that entire nations, thousands of years later, are literally existing or not existing because of the blessing of the Father. Do you get that? The blessing of the Father was so sought after that Jacob decided to cheat Esau and deceive his father just to get it. Now today, we would say, okay, well, I would cheat and, and you know, uh, pagans would cheat and steal and lie to their father to get an inheritance, a physical inheritance. But a blessing? Really? We are not a spiritual people today. Or we would understand that when a father speaks to his children, he is pronouncing life or death. The reality of a physical blessing is off the charts in God's realm. It is real. That's why he says, I will bless those who, 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 who uh, bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. Do you think it's just nomenclature? Do you think it's just an enigmatic expression or a metaphor? No, not at all. He means what he says. And today, that inheritance of the birthright includes this. In ancient days, it includes the priestly blessing. It includes the double portion inheritance because the firstborn had to take care of the rest of the tribes. If anything went wrong, he needed that kitty. He needed that 401k account, if you will. That's what the double portion was. 
He had prominence among the, amongst the brothers he was looked up to. He was basically called the executor of the state uh, in today's language. He had spiritual and physical authority. The rest of the brethren, it didn't matter how old they were. They respected and submitted to the firstborn. If he had that spiritual authority that was given in the blessing, everyone had to submit to his authority. Do you know why? It, now, listen, some of you have multiple siblings. You have five, six, seven siblings. How many of you would be difficult if the firstborn, if the blessing was given to the secondborn and you were the firstborn to submit to your younger brother? Think about that for a minute. That's serious. That's very, very difficult. Much less submit a younger brother submitting to an older brother today, period, would be difficult. But the reason why in ancient Hebrew culture this was so critical and why Esau and Ishmael hate their younger brothers today is because whoever received the blessing is receiving the name of their father. And in ancient days, names were authority. Names had mission. Names had purpose. Where do you think we get the idea of passing the name from the father to the next young son? My last name is Staley. I am the third. If I had a son, it would be a Staley. Why, where do we get that idea of passing the name from? It comes all the way back from the Bible in Hebrew culture where the name of the father was passed down. Except the difference is, is that the name carried authority. Perfect example, I was hunting in southern Missouri. I've told the story before. And my grandmother, my great-grandmother had an 80-acre farm down there. I used to spend summers down there. But I went down with a friend of mine years and years ago to go hunting, and I'm hunting on this property, and all of a sudden, uh, someone comes along and is yelling at me, telling me this is private property and private property and private property, until they came up, and they looked at me, took their glasses off, and said, are you a Staley? They said, oh my goodness, you look just like your father at your age, and it ended up being a relative of mine, and boy, did the atmosphere change instantaneously, as soon as he found out who I was, everything changed. Do you realize that the name that you carry carries authority? Ultimately, you're supposed to have the name of God written over your name, which is what gives you authority in the earth realm. That's why every authority has no authority outside the name of God. And any authority that places himself in authority outside of Yahweh putting him there will be drugged down. Lastly, today that spiritual authority is symbolized by this, the Temple Mount. This is why the Temple Mount, if you wonder in prophecy, again, this teaching is just a very broad brush of context for next week. But if you ever wonder why the Temple Mount is so sought after, why they want this so bad, is because this is the actual seed of, this is the actual bullseye of the inheritance of Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael. This was the place that Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, but the Quran says that Abraham went to sacrifice Ishmael. This is why this is so critical. This is why they're fighting over this, because this is the inheritance of the firstborn. It's not any piece of land. It's the piece of land of their father, Abraham. I know it's hard to put your mind around it, but can you believe that the Arabs and the Philistines, if you will, uh, Esau, they're, they're, all their father is a, it's the same person. This is a family feud, just like I started out. How many family feuds do we have going on just in this congregation alone? You see, you're more Israelite than you know. Look at this. This in Hebrew is the word Adam and Edom. The same root three letter, when you, when you narrow it down, the same three root letter word of Adam and Edom is the same three letters. Aleph, Dalet, and Mem. With two incredibly different interpretations or definitions. Let's go through them real quick. We're almost finished. 
Adam is the divine presence. So the divine presence is with Adam. It means divine blood. Edom is to goad, poke, or try to control Adam. So the difference between Adam and Edom is one of them carries the divine presence of God and one of them is goading or poking Adam, the real Adam. So this is how you have Adam and Edom, both of them coming from the same DNA, same name. Vowel pointing is a little bit different, give you a totally different definition. Ultimately, there is a prophetic message in this because every one of us, inside of every one of you is a conflict. The Bible says, Paul says this, he says, there is inside of me a war. Remember this? Romans chapter 7, there's a war in my members. Part of me wants to do the right thing. The other part of me doesn't want to do the right thing. Ultimately, if you actually read that chapter, what he wants to do is he wants to keep the law of God. Read it. It's incredible. But his flesh won't let him keep the commandments of God. He says, what a wretched man that I am. What's inside of him? The two natures of man. It is Edom and Adam. It is the same conflict that is happening in the physical realm today with Israel and the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip with Hamas. Is the same conflict that you are having with your flesh right now. In the earth realm, God is tired of the enemy occupying your territory. You are the one, we are the ones that gave the enemy that little, small, little beach strip in our life. Because you know what? We didn't really want to get rid of the sin completely because that area is beautiful. And by the way, if you saw the pictures of the Gaza Strip, you would not even be able to tell the difference between that and Hawaii. It is that beautiful. There's even a video online that you can, you can find that goes through all the pictures of Gaza and says, which city is this? Mediterranean, beaches, you know, Bahamas, and it, it looks all of those. Palm trees, the whole deal, and it's literally just the Gaza Strip. I mean, we don't want to get rid of that because it's so precious to us. But the truth is, is that the enemy is throwing missiles at the temple of God inside of you from the dark places. When you give the enemy a small area in your life, he throws missiles to the other parts of your DNA. And his whole point, you know what he wants? He wants more land. Do you see the prophetic picture within Hamas and the enemies of Israel today? They're only looking for one thing, more land. Do you know why? They want to eradicate the people of God. They want to eradicate the entire inheritance. They want to take over your temple. The enemy wants to take over everything you are and ultimately make sure that that third temple doesn't get built. Spirit and flesh. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What you are watching on the news, ladies and gentlemen, and I close with this, is you are watching the story of your life. You are watching the history channel of who you are and what is to come. Because inside of every one of us, you have a Jacob. Inside of every one of us, you have an Esau. And it depends on whether or not you're going to be a wild donkey and operate during the night and do all those things and give the enemy access to that strip of land in your life or you're going to be like Jacob and you're going to put an iron dome of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God around you. Did you know the Word of God is the only thing that's going to protect you? You need to know it. With all the prophecies and all of the ministries that focus on prophecy, few will tell you what I'm about to tell you. The only way to navigate through the truth and through the lie, is to know the Torah inside and out. Because here's the deal. You can memorize the New Testament inside and out. And it will help you in the godly character that you are supposed to develop. No questions asked. But when the Antichrist comes on the scene, and when the religious 
tenors change ever so slightly in this generation or the next, the only way you're going to know whether that prophet is of God is whether what he says lines up with the front of the book. And the set stage of the great falling away is this, in a short nutshell, hands down. The enemy has been, remember, he has a long-term plan. He changes nations, not overnight, long-term. And he has been setting up God's people for such a time as the great delusion by making us believe that the front of the book doesn't matter we will miss who the Antichrist really is. Because the Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be a very eloquent person. He's going to be really good at getting into the emotional seat of who you are. And when all the world falls to to hell in a handbasket, he's going to be able to provide solutions. He's not going to be as obvious as you might think. He might even be a theologian. Might have the Bible memorized from to back. And he might say everything that we want to hear. But how you will know whether a prophet is a prophet of God is the same exact definition from the early front of the book when it says a prophet will never speak against what is already spoken. So if God says this, and a man comes along and says something different, even though it aligns with the current religious system, only the people who know and understand, and by the way, have wisdom. Where do you get wisdom? The Bible says the front of the book. will actually see it. And they'll see right through it. While the entire religious system hates you for it. Because everyone championing champions Rocky Balboa. Everybody wants the underdog. Everybody's looking at the person that is solving the world's problem. But at the end of the night, the only thing that's going to save you, I'm telling you, is knowing the Word of God and doing what it says. That is the definition of a wise virgin. Everyone else lamps, go out. There's a reason why that story was told. They knew what the lamps were. They knew what it represented. They knew what the oil was. It's only us 21st century Christians that don't have a clue. So we make up every one for each denomination that we're in. We make up a new interpretation because we are afraid to go back to the front and read the story from the beginning. Stand with me this evening. I want to let you know that the importance of this showdown is not happening in the physical realm only. If we, I have said this once, I've said it a thousand times, whatever happens in the physical realm, there is a spiritual message at the same time, paralleling it exactly. Whatever God is doing in the physical realm, He is doing it in the spiritual realm. The problem is we don't have eyes to see or ears to hear, so we miss it, and He has to go around the mountain again. There's a war in Israel. There is a war in greater Israel worldwide where the enemy, Hamas, is trying to destroy us again. And we don't even know who we are. So there's nothing to go back to because the way that you win wars in Israel, there's only one way. My Bible says it. God said it very cleanly and very clearly. He says, if you humble yourself and come back to my covenant and keep my Torah, you win every battle. I will be with you, he says. We just read it today. Deuteronomy chapter 3. If you do not keep my word, You're on your own, and you'll be slaves in your own nation. And ladies and gentlemen, wake up. We are about to be slaves in our own nation. We're boiling like the frog slowly, and we don't even know it until we wake up, and it's too late. So shall I end 
with a most famous scripture that says, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then, listen, it says then, I will hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. And the context is about his people Israel coming back into covenant. We are in those days where we need to not only pray for Israel of the Jewish people today, of modern Israel, but pray for those who are aligned with the root of Jesse and are called Israel in the spiritual DNA of being grafted into the tree unless we come back into covenant and start doing Bible things in Bible ways and loving each other the way that God wants us to and displaying His character, the light on the hill, we have no chance of surviving even our own country. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us for being so blind for so many decades, so many centuries. Moses and his commandments are etched on every courthouse in America. Yet we remove them from our very system. This country is founded upon the principles of your word and how the front of the book matters. Yet God from our pulpit in every denomination we denounce you and we don't even know it. The very thing that in Romans 3.31 God Paul says he upholds is the very thing that we have destroyed. We don't even let it in. So, Father, we don't know how to do it. But, God, I want to declare that this group of people wants to be in covenant with you in the most desperate way. We want to be perfectly aligned. We don't want to just be in the car believing in Yeshua. We want our tires to be perfectly aligned and our motor to be tuned. This is a race. Father, I pray that you would awaken the spirits of your people. They don't have to totally understand or even fully agree, God, but their spirit has to be quickened to even look further at these things. That Esau is coming. Ishmael is here. The battle is before us. And we are naked without weapons. And the only weapon that I know of in your word is the sword of the Spirit and the truth that girds our waistline. Yahweh, I pray that you would embed your word back into your people, that your people would humble themselves and pray, get rid of all of the traditions and doctrines of men that are holding us back from the blessing that our next generation, the Y generation, would never ask why again. They would simply obey and be empowered like the Joshua generation. Father, if we're at the end of the age, then this is the time that you equip your people. Equip us well. We submit to you. We surrender to you. And we thank you for even letting us have the opportunity to be in your army. In Yeshua's name, and everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. May the Lord God bless you. May He keep you. May His face shine upon you. May He be gracious to you. And at the end of the day, may His countenance be lifted up over you and may He give you shalom. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Shabbat shalom. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you, and God bless.